And sadly, they're indoctrinated with evolution. But it's not just young people. It's not just children who are amazed by these creatures. Adults, too. You think about how many magazines, month after month, they, they grace their covers with an image of what we believe these amazing creatures look like. Young and old alike, we are absolutely amazed by the dinosaur. And I imagine you with quite the library, Mr. Quartermain. All those books you must have read merely by looking at their covers. I would ask you, before you stiffen your neck, before you harden your heart, Join me as we examine some evidence together. For instance, January 2005, American researchers discovered a dinosaur that had been eaten by a mammal. It was a, a fossilized mammal that had a dinosaur in its belly. Now you say, yeah, Brad, so what? What's the big deal? Folks, remember the evolutionary timeline. According to that theory, mammals didn't come into the picture until millions of years later. And yet, we've got a, a mammal that was eating a dinosaur. This does not fit the evolutionary timeline, huh? Well, Brad, I present unto you Morganusodon, a now extinct creature, the fossils of which have been found in great numbers in Glamorgan, as well as the Yunnan province in China. Paleontologists are so familiar with these specimens that the researchers of the Smithsonian have given this animal the nickname Morgi. It has been determined by studying the physiology of this creature, particularly the mandibles, that it was primarily an insectivore, but much like the modern shrew, would have preyed upon anything it could have overpowered. What you might find intriguing is that Morganusodon was a member of a mammalian genus, which lived in the late Triassic period a period which it shared with the Aeoraptor lunesus, early crocodiliforms, the Archosaur postosuchus, and the unforgettable Coelophysis. Folks, remember the evolutionary timeline. According to that theory, mammals didn't come into the picture until millions of years later. And yet, we've got a, a mammal that was eating a dinosaur. However, Morganusodon is not by any means an anomaly as far as prehistoric mammals are concerned. Scientists in both fields of paleontology and evolutionary biology have been aware of many species of mammals sharing the earth with dinosaurs. Species such as Alphadon, Frutifosaur, and not to mention one of my personal favorites, Castoricata, which has come to be known as the beaver of the Cretaceous, are all great examples. But why am I putting such emphasis on Morganusodon? It's not like Harab had mentioned these animals by name. Well, aside from them having been such cute little rascals, the emphasis is due to their emplacement in the prehistoric time frame, which is of great importance, especially if one is to examine Brad Harab's claim that a mammal living with dinosaurs is somehow incongruent with the evolutionary timeline. As I had stated earlier, Morganusodon lived in the latter part of the Triassic period, and when put into the prehistoric context, this would have predated both the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, both periods of which were the times of dinosaurs which even the individuals least educated on the subject of paleontology would easily recognize, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Paracerolophus, Velociraptor, the esteemed Tyrannosaurus rex, Pachycephalosaurus, Brachiosaurus, all lived alongside prehistoric mammals, and this is no secret among scientists, including evolutionary biologists. And back before all of these awesome dinosaurs that I have mentioned ever roamed the earth was Morganusodon, a mere mammal capable of preying upon the hapless and lesser reptiles of the Triassic period. To the lack of surprise of scientists, Morganusodon, and other mammals from this period can be counted among the earliest in the evolutionary timeline. Outstanding investigative work, Mr. Harib. I'm so glad that somebody finally stepped up and delivered this evidence to those nasty evolutionists who can't accept that mammals and dinosaurs once lived simultaneously. Oh wait, that's right. 
every evolutionary biologist and paleontologist knows they existed simultaneously. And to claim that the evolutionary timeline would suggest otherwise would be absolutely preposterous. But what was the purpose of Harab making the erroneous statement that according to evolutionary theory, mammals came after dinosaurs? Well, let's listen to some more of his claims and give Mr. Harab the time of day he may deserve. Maybe his purpose and motives will become a little more clear. You know, evolutionists are stuck with the, the task of trying to figure out how did life get out of the sea and onto land? Kind of how you're stuck with the task of finding a single paleontologist or evolutionary biologist who believes that mammals came specifically after dinosaurs? Oh wait, that was in Polytomy to Interrupt. Please go on. Their answer was a creature called the coelacanth. They found some fossils that had these funny little front lobe fins. They assumed that those were like little arms and that this guy crawled out of the water onto the beach. So according to Harib, the coelacanth was the answer evolutionists used to explain how water-dwelling animals eventually became animals that lived on land. Coelacanth did exhibit a unique sequence of adaptations along with other lobe-finned fish of the Devonian, but nothing as significant as Harib would have us believe, especially when compared to some of the other animals of the era. There are numerous examples in the fossil record of certain species which are known transitional life forms that did have a crucial part in the water-to-land shift. Ichthyostega and Pandarichthys are just two of many Devonian air fish whose fins began to take the form of non-jointed digits and deviate away from fish fins as we know them. And let's not forget the discovery of another Devonian air animal which is a member of the order Apisostegalia, the lobe-finned fish Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik even went as far as to have front fins with arm-like skeletal structures that even included a shoulder, elbow, and wrist. Another attribute which set these transitional life forms apart from regular fish was their means of propulsion, which was by way of their pectoral and pelvic fins moving in a manner that was ideal for navigating on land as well as in water. The common fish of the Devonian era and their modern descendants, for the most part, use their tail fins as a chief source of propulsion. This is one of the reasons they are limited to whatever pool, pond, lake, river, or sea in which they find themselves confined, until possibly affected by seasonal change or fluctuations in water level. But, when along come animals whose adaptations are taking advantage of a rise in global oxygen content and can move between the tide pools and swamplands in search of food items, natural selection seems to have favored a shift for many species to be land-dwelling. It seems as though Harib views any Devonian-era lobe-finned fish as interchangeable with another one. And that's really sad, especially when he thinks that scientists point to the coelacanth as their link in the water-to-land question, when there are so many more dramatic and interesting examples of speciation involved in this exact process. Aside from all of Harab's yammering about how scientists are struggling to establish a link that marks when life took to land, the fact of the matter remains. The transition of animals in successive generations, going from water-dwelling to land-dwelling, is by no means a complex concept. It can even be seen unfolding to this day. Scientists certainly aren't struggling to present evidence that there was a period in Earth's history where the vast majority of life was living in an aqueous environment and many species became more keen to life on land. The reason being is simple enough. The evidence which suggests so is overwhelmingly abundant. In the fossil record there are even many instances of organisms going through the reverse. The ancestors of modern whales such as Cuchicetus, Ambulocetus, and Pactocetus were land-dwelling mammals who gradually became better suited for a marine lifestyle with their descendants becoming the more heavy-set, all but buoyant life forms we see them as today. When compared to the other examples of tetrapod ancestors from the Devonian, the coelacanth is rather lackluster in terms of their significance in evolution, and Harib is wrong about the level of focus scientists place on the coelacanth to answer the water-to-land question. They are aware of where the coelacanth fits with respect to the 
very striking tetrapods that exhibit more articulated features. However, let's let Harib continue his point. They dated him 325 to 410 million years. And in fact, if you were to travel around to places like the Fernbank Museum in Atlanta, you'll find that we're still teaching it. Textbooks still have these images of, of a fish-like creature walking out onto the beach. The only problem is the coelacanth didn't live 325 to 410 million years ago. They're very much still living today. People off the coast of Madagascar and India, they've been catching them for decades. They call them junk fish. Harib is correct regarding this issue, and he does speak the truth. The coelacanth is still living, and it was long thought to have gone extinct in the Cretaceous period, around 65 million years ago. When the first living coelacanth was found, it was a very exciting time. And since then, many more specimens of coelacanth have been collected and studied. But this is a problem for evolutionists. How, exactly? It could be that the theory of evolution, according to Harib, requires that all living things must undergo constant and distinctive change over periods of time, with longer periods such as the 65 million years that the coelacanth was thought to have been extinct, producing more dramatic changes. This is, however, a common misconception amongst those who do not understand the theory of evolution. There are numerous extant life forms amongst us who have undergone little or no change in what can sometimes be the hundreds of millions of years that they have been around. These creatures are known as living fossils by scientists, and the coelacanth is just another example of one. Sorry, Harab, but remarkable changes to the morphology of a species is not always a requirement as life evolves.